Hey, what is going on, family? Welcome to another episode of the Grow Your Side Business Podcast. Now, if you've been rocking with me for a while, you know we've been running now for six years straight. And today, what I thought I would do is take you back to 2017. That's right, June 2017, I got an opportunity to interview an incredible CEO of an incredible company right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. At that time, they were valued at uh, just shy of $1.4 billion company. And today, they've done some incredible things. Well, I wanted to show you the beginning of where this really started because in a little while, I'm going to be interviewing that CEO again. That's right, five years later. And I want you guys to watch this interview that I did back in June of 2017 with the CEO, Chris Elmore of Avid Exchange. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you let somebody else know and tell the people over at Avid Exchange, man, I'm blessed and I appreciate being able to get my game started working with somebody as awesome as Chris Elmore. Check out the interview. So here, this is my favorite story about the early days. Our very first pitch was in New York City. We got this meeting with this guy, and he was a huge venture capitalist. Okay. In all the ways that you can think of a huge New York City venture capitalist would be. Right. And he asked us the name of our company, and we said, it's Avid Exchange. And he said, I guess all the good names have been taken. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so guess how much we raised? Zero. Zero, <laughs> yeah. So we were forced, which is really good. By the way, the company is here today because we raised zero. Mm. Um, people can get money at people get money at the wrong time from the wrong person for the wrong reason will kill their business. Today, um, this is really, really cool. I am actually in the headquarters of a really interesting company, Avid Exchange, which um, I have not been in a headquarters like this in Charlotte in quite some time. So um, we're gonna get a chance to talk to not only just some of the employees, but also at the same time, we're gonna chat with one of the headmen who is responsible for not only things like this, but also walls like that, that guy. So we're gonna get a chance to talk to Chris Elmore today. And Chris by far has got to be one of the most interesting people around. And so we're gonna get a chance today to actually stop and talk to some employees. We're gonna also learn a little bit about what is happening within this space. But you're gonna get a chance to really hear from Chris about his world. And, and I'm sorry, I don't mean me, Chris. I mean the other Chris. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute. All right, so, see this lady? Tell them your name. Uh, I'm Katie Milligan. That's Katie. Katie. And Katie, what do you do? I am the director of Avapay Services Operations. What that actually means is I run the back-end work of okay. actually getting payments out the door. Awesome, so Katie, what do you know about Chris? Chris Elmore, he has a really cool tattoo on his on his arm. Have you seen it? Oh, really? I haven't seen it yet. I'll have oh, to yeah. ask him during the interview. Yeah, you'll have to ask him about it. Okay. Um, but obviously, he helped start Avid. He's one of like our oldest employees, not age as he mm. probably say. She but... just said it first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, He's old. No. <laughs> I did not say that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's definitely one that uh, you know does the most chores for everyone. You know, hangs out and really is the the voice of Avid. I feel like. So before Avid, what were you doing? Funny story. I was actually a medic from Mecklenburg County. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. Um, I was pre med in college okay. and uh, realized I. I'm not supposed to be in the medical field, oh. so I realized that after about a year or so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then one day Avid called and the world changed, and how did you go from being in the medical field to this? So I actually started out being a payment specialist. My brother used to work here as a developer, Okay. and he basically was like, I know you're looking for something, this is a startup, it's really cool. Um, came, was really just looking for something in the interim. Okay. And then ended up just falling in love with the company. I've been here over five years. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is like the one cool thing about working here that has been like a staple that just makes it fun every day? So I have the ability to put my name on something here. Okay. Uh, Charlotte is a huge banking city. It is. Um, and trying to change anything at a bank takes quarters it takes committees and all sorts of other really awful things um, aka red tape yes okay 
here I can actually come up with an idea one day and implement it next week. So, I mean, obviously doing the back end work, but they really give you the ability to, you know, kind of create your own role sometimes mm -hmm. and really focus on what your passion is. Now, you all might notice here on High Level Wisdom that uh, we're not sitting in an office, by the way. Uh, we're literally just sitting out in the lobby. For all you office people who still think that office is the best place to be, Katie says don't do it. No, I actually don't have an office and I'm a director, so yeah. This is our office. Yep, like, downstairs. I like just it. Just downstairs. <laughs> See, like, it's just stuff. Thank you for being on. You're welcome. This is going to be a good interview today, It is. Actually. You're uh, going to have fun with Chris. I, I, think, I think we will, and uh, hopefully we don't have to bleep out anything. <laughs> Um, so. um, actually you were, I actually was good. <laughs> I did not curse once. So that's, that's actually saying something. Um, this is going to be really, really fun. I just had an opportunity to meet Katie, who was pretty cool. And I'm interviewing this guy who's walking away right now. That guy right there. Talk to this group? Yeah, absolutely. So, today's gonna be fun. You guys look great. I know. That's what he just said. They do. They look good. They're like camera ready. Katie's giving me some really good stuff to ask you, some secret oh. stuff. Oh. This is gonna be great. You, do you have like a beat button, like a bleep? <laughs> I have one of those. Would you do one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll put one up. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always wanted to get bleep. I'm always <laughs> wanted to get bleep. So tell us a little bit about what it's like working here at Avid. And what and what you do too. Yeah, that'd be I, great. I know a little bit about what you do. So now we're in conversion. It used to be APD by itself, but now we're all in conversion. So we're trying to. Uh, generate as much revenue as possible for multiple products. So, Avid Pay Direct as well as credit cards. So, all we want to do is convert and make money for the company. And that's what we do. Thank you. Give us your name? Bill Coffin. Yeah. And what do you do here? I am a team coach for now the conversion team. All right. Yeah. My name is Nikisha Scott. I work on the conversion team in sales. Um, it's awesome working here. It's a lot of freedom um, and it's good work. So, I love it. Show, let's show. Let's see your nails. <laughs> no, we can't do that. <laughs> what was on the other hand? Nothing. Oh, nothing? Oh, no. Oh, we can't bleep that part out this either? This is LeBron James. <laughs> yeah. We're going to get a win today. Go Cavs. All right. Go Cavs. You I'm Bree. I'm on the conversion team as well. I'm Bill's team. Um, team is her. I like Avid Exchange. It's very um, chill and relaxed. Um, you know, I like the fact that we're able to come to work and just be free and able to pretty much, as long as we're getting our job done, we're able to, you know, not be as micromanaged as some other companies. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. She yeah. said something real important though, because she said, as long as I'm getting my job done, yeah. because there's, there's a price to the chillness, isn't right. there? And exactly. there, and there's a, and you probably have known some, have some friends that just w treated it way too chill. Right, they were too chill and they did their job. So, yeah. you know. The so there's always so I'm sorry. Go ahead. Also, they got the boot. They got the boot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know the great thing about Avid, you fire yourself here. I so know, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing. Promote but yourself, you, know, you promote yourself too. Mm -hmm. You fire yourself and you promote yourself. So uh, you know every time we get the feedback, it's chill. There's a quiet intensity underneath that. Right. There, you said you got to get your work done. Right. I don't want to. I don't want to gloss over that because. You do. You got big work to do. You got a lot of stuff to do, and it's got to get done well. So, thanks, guys. I appreciate Ooh. that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to yet another great day, another great interview right here on High Level Wisdom for New Generation Leaders. I am actually really excited about this interview. Uh, as Me you too. Know. <laughs> and, and what's funny is, is that we share the same first name. That's so right. I promise when I introduce my guest that you see here sitting on my left, I'm not like 
talking about myself here. We actually share the same name. And what's really cool about today is that uh, as you've seen from some of the things that we've put out already, uh, some of the fun things that I was able to do while I was here at Avid Exchange, um, I learned a lot and had an opportunity to learn from some of the employees who work here. But more importantly, there is a buzz of culture that exists inside of Avid Exchange that has a lot to do with my guest today. Now, he's been around for quite some time, but this venture has probably been more than just a, a, a baby to him. It has been something that has been a idea realized and taking over a corner of Charlotte, North Carolina like none other. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce to some present to others, my guest, Chris Elmore. Chris, how are you, man? I mean, it would be great if you could do like a, an applause. Yeah, I'll, I'll add the applause in there for a little special Chris, effect, I'm right? doing great. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. And then let me do one thing real quick. Absolutely. Let me pat you on the back a little bit. Okay. Are you okay? Are you good with that? Uh, I, I, okay. I, that hasn't happened yet. So <laughs> yeah. let's, let's, let's because, go. Because here's the reason why. is because I think this notion of baby boomers, Communicating to millennials is absolutely genius. Ah, okay. Yeah, and I don't know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how much of a fundamental that idea that is to what you do, but um, how'd you come up with that? So he's interviewing me now, people, just so you guys can tell. So um, is that is that not cool? Uh, no, 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 it's fine because I, I, I do. I have been known to flip the script <laughs> a little bit. It, it's fine. So um, the way it came up was for me, just in short, here was that. Um, I've had my own experiences when I was young in my corporate career. And I remember having trouble at a certain level. I was young and really excelling yeah. and kind of feeling like there was a ceiling. And somebody pulled me to the side who was a great uh, mentor of mine and said, hey, it's not your fault. It's just the fact that you're young. Yeah. And people are afraid of what they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And as I began to do research and all my speaking and training, I realized that this was really a thing. I didn't realize that it was a generational thing. So millennials who are now taking over management, yeah. upper management, and yeah. sometimes like senior executive positions yeah. in companies, but then also baby boomers who are also facing a shared transition where baby boomers who are leaders are realizing that I have to give this over at some point. Some are resistant to it. Some don't want to do it, yeah. right? But here's what I found very interesting and part of the reason why I'm interested in talking to you today is the institutional knowledge that is lost because we either resist to give away information yeah. to, to help find a successor and groom people properly, yeah. but then also how much it costs the company to lose that when that yeah. person walks yeah. out of the door. Yeah. Or we try to stick a straw in that person's head and hope that within the six to eight months that they raise their hand to say they're retiring, yeah. we get everything out of them. Yeah. And what I realize is, is it's that quite the visual. It, it, it's, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's difficult, right? Yeah. And so it makes it hard on the new person trying to absorb all that information. Yeah. But then if you have a resistant person who's not wanting to give up a whole lot, yeah. right? And not wanting to share those intangibles, then they walk out of the door with more than just 25, 30 years of experience. They walk out with institutional knowledge that is invaluable to the company moving forward. And that's what I care about. Yeah. Because I realize that millennials are today and the future. They're shaping it with the help of Xers, <laughs> right? But millennials have introduced so. very um, millennials have introduced a very interesting disruption because native digital. That's all you have to say. <laughs> native digital that did not happen prior to millennials. Yeah. So it just creates this new way of thinking, uh, new irritants. I would say new abrasions that kind of happen in boardrooms today because millennials see an easier way to do things yeah. while sometimes boomers look at it and go, well, we've never done it. That yeah, way. we did. Yeah, okay. it's always worked this way. I was working with a, I was working with a bank that is a subsidiary there in Florida and they're kind of like corporate bank is in Spain. And okay. the corporate bank in Spain was founded in like 1406. Wow. And could you imagine being part of a company that goes that far back so when someone says, we've never done it that way. <laughs> they really mean it. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I, I was watching uh, Seth uh, Godin, who, who's an exceptional genius of a person. I mean, everything from writing Lynchpin and all the books that he's done and his blogs worldwide. He, he said something recently on an interview that I saw, and he talked about how uh, because things are changing, um, it's hurting 
the ability to innovate because so many people are so staunch to the way they've done things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for, he gave this really cool example. He said when Henry Ford had a factory, he needed that many people yeah. to run the factory. Yeah. Today, I don't need that many people yeah. on an assembly line because no. I got robots, yeah. I got technology, yeah. I have more efficient ways of doing things. So what does that do to the average worker, the, the way of thinking, right? Yeah. And so he talked all about the changes to education. All you know, there's a, there's a name for that. What's that? It's called creative destruction. And Ooh. so creative destruction, okay. and so what, and we study this in my class. Interesting. So I teach at UNCC and Queens. I teach entrepreneurship okay. and innovation. And so creative destruction is when um, innovation automates or, or innovation pushes out either task in jobs or whole jobs. Wow. And um, the reason why I teach it in my class is because if you can understand what creative destruction is and then you know, apply it to your product. I'll give you an example. At Avid Exchange, when we automate the accounting process, we free up 8,000 hours. That's 8,000 hours that goes wow. back to the company. Interesting. And then now what they do with that 8,000 hours, the interesting thing is, well, it's true, there are certain tasks that you just won't have to do anymore. Right. But the thing that people don't realize is, yeah, those, those people won't do those tasks, but what they do is they go on to do more important things. Right. And that's actually how we sell the software. Interesting. We sell the software based on the fact that it generates time. Mm. And so the questions, so tech entrepreneurs, as far as my voice can reach, <laughs> they, they, they do the same thing over and over again that just irritates me to no end. And that is they concentrate way too much on the software, the app, okay. the thing. <laughs> right and not the impact that the thing has. Interesting, wow. So if you think about huh. that, yeah. If wow. you think about that, the, whatever the thing is and whatever the thing does and whatever the impact is, is always more valuable than the thing. Interesting. Always. So, so, so let's, let's, let's talk about that with Avid Exchange. Let, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Let, let's, let's go before- Do we have to? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to help our, our audience understand like the, I think one of the things is when somebody looks at you today and they yeah. see this interview, yeah. they see this end product, the, the yeah. version of end yeah. today, right? Yeah. They don't realize like what it, yeah. how, how this thing kind of evolved, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't see the entrepreneur's journey to get into here today, yeah. right? And so I, I want to, let's, let's even go back I to... It, I go all the way back. I'll give you a couple. Of, well, yeah. You want to go fa further than that? I, I would say let's maybe even just start with... How did Avid Exchange start as an idea? What, what, what was the thing you were looking to solve for at the moment? So what if you could find a community of corporate professionals who also have side businesses and we're all just trying to learn from each other and learn how to grow? Well, that's why I'm here. You should join the Grow Your Side Business Challenge. That's right. I want you right now. Go to it right now. GrowYourSideBusiness.com. And guess what? You can opt into my five-day challenge. One hour per day, you and I are gonna to get together with a ton of other community people who guess what? We're all trying to grow our side businesses and we wanna know how to do it the right way the first time. Well, guess what? I'm gonna teach you some things that you didn't even know that you should be doing to leverage your corporate day job while also at the same time learning how to build that side business. And you're gonna find out that actually if you do your side business the right way, it will impact the way you show up at work. And I'm gonna show you some things that you didn't even know was possible. So for five days, for one hour a day, you and I get together. Now I got two ways you can experience that. You could jump in to the general admission. Well, guess what? You just get access to the live training right then and there each and every day for one hour a day. Or you could jump into the VIP experience. My VIP people get a chance to actually talk with me, actually ask questions every single day if you would like to before the actual training. So guess what? You want to jump into the VIP experience because that is where you'll be able to get your questions answered and including the actual training live. So go to growyoursidebusiness.com, jump into the challenge, and I look forward to seeing you there. Well, so now, first of all, just real quick. So here's a couple of, here's, here's who we are today. Our value is 1.4 billion. Okay. Which that's pretty good. That's awesome. <laughs> and then we, um, we, we generate about, this year's goal is like 129 million. Okay. Last year's was 100, the year before that was 50, the year before that was 25. Okay. You get the point, you right. see how the ramp goes. Right. And, um, and we're aiming for 350. Okay. And that's, that's kind of in our, 
that's in our wheelhouse. Uh, we have 1,200 employees and we're the ninth largest fintech financial technology company in the country right now. Wow. And, but here's the thing that I love to tell people, hopefully this will tell you how super rare this is. And um, we're known as what's called a business unicorn. You, you know what a business unicorn is? Yes, okay. absolutely. <laughs> it's, a, it's any company that has a, a value over a billion that's privately held, which, right. is, which is who we are. Right. But here's the thing that most people don't know about a business unicorn, is that you're three times more likely to make the NFL than you are to create a business unicorn. <laughs> that's Isn't true. that crazy? 90% of all business unicorns are in Silicon Valley. Okay, so we have yeah. one here right in Charlotte, North Carolina. Which is hard to pull off. It's crazy hard to pull off. And so I like to baseline that by saying it didn't start like that. Right, so it right. started, so it was, it was five of us. Mm -hmm. And now all five of us were connected. And the other thing about all five of us were we weren't friends. Mm. We weren't roommates. We weren't buddies. Now, we weren't adversaries or enemies. But it's one thing that I like for people to think about when they start thinking about starting their company is that you have to have a partner. Yeah. You have to have a couple of partners at best because that's always that give and take. And, um, and one of the things that we didn't do very well with, which I think we suffered, is that we weren't real diverse. Mm. You know, we were a bunch of college-educated white guys. Okay. And entrepreneurs never put too much on diversity because they're just trying to get the bills paid. Right, right. And, it's something, and, that, and that's like something, well, that can come later. Right, right. But... Um, it probably would have been better if we'd have mixed it up just a little mm, bit. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Because that would have been part of our fabric. But anyway, we had an idea to um, we had an idea to create a real estate exchange, which meant that we wanted to uh, court and woo suppliers to come on our website and sell to real estate property managers. Okay. So here, this is my favorite story about the early days. Our very first pitch was in New York City. We got this meeting with this guy. And he was a huge venture capitalist okay. in all the ways that you can think of a huge New York City venture capitalist would be. Right. And he asked us the name of our company, and we said, it's Avid Exchange. And he said, I guess all the good names have been taken. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so guess how much we raised? Zero. Zero, yeah. So we were forced, which is really good. By the way, the company is here today because we raised zero. Mm. Um, people can get money at people get money at the wrong time from the wrong person for the wrong reason will kill their business interesting even in the first it, even in the first 15 hires if you hire someone who's toxic can kill the business that's right absolutely yeah. culture is so important it's incredibly important so what we were forced to do was sell our software mm. and nobody wanted it so mm. we changed it and we we said well how about this one and nobody wanted it and we changed it for a third time is what Third time is the, the charm. It's well, this was a failure too. Oh, this was a failure. <laughs> I wish it was. So we had a third offering. We sent out to the marketplace, and the market said, "Place said, forget it." Okay. And that was two years. And so, if you think about those three in failures, I mean, I can come back to that because I don't believe in failure. Right. You know, and if you think about those three products in the marketplace, saying no thanks. Um, it, here's the great thing about failure. And the great thing about failure is for some reason, you know when you start something and maybe you're with your buddies or you're with your, your wife or your spouse or whatever, and you're like, I got this great idea. And they're like, yeah, it's a great idea. We're going to take on the world. I call that fluff. Right, right. So you got all this fluff. And the great thing about three failures in two years is you have no more fluff. Right. <laughs> the right. fluff is gone. <laughs> and so we had three goals. And I remember, I remember it clear as I was sitting here right here talking about them. And the first goal was we wanted to create a piece of software people were willing to buy. Right. Now that's something that tech entrepreneurs and a lot of entrepreneurs just miss. Mm -hmm. Is that they want to create something that maybe is cool or something that they like. Something that people already know about. <laughs> There's a lot to that. And, 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 and you know... We can talk about idea creation because when you create, when you take something that is already being done, you've commoditized yourself to the point where you have no margin for error. Mm -hmm. And so when you're truly innovative, you have huge margins for error. Interesting. Because you're defining the market. Right. right. So anyway. Here we are. We wanted to create a piece of software people were willing to buy. We wanted to create a piece of software that people were willing to buy at a high price mm -hmm. because of this. Uh, impact, not greed. 
Okay. So we felt like if it was a high price, it would have a big impact. Mm -hmm. Not because we want to get rich. Right, right. Entrepreneurs that want to get rich within six weeks usually go, you know, Bob's back up. to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, the, fir the first year we were in business, I got my car repo, oh, which wow. was a uh, Nissan Altima. So that's like Whoa. two strikes. That's the most affordable car in the world. That's right. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> but it. But let me ask you a question. Sure. In because it, it's fascinating. So three times, as you said, you, it's unique in the way you worded it. The market said no. The market said no, yeah. Did you feel like that was a personal rejection? Like how, how did that hit you? for three times for you guys to put something together, invest your time, money, and energy in, put it out there for the world, and people said no. Because I'm sure eventually now, your associates start looking at you going, okay, he's got, I don't know what's his problem. Well, it's not, the associates aren't <laughs> as bad as your family. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. My, my family and my in-laws were just, part of them were digging it because they just love to see us struggle. And then right. the other, the other part was like, what are you doing? Just get it together. Right. Go get a job. Get a job. Yeah, get a job. <laughs> Go get a job. You know, um, I hope this sticks with someone because this mm -hmm. was, this was, looking back, I see it now. Then, I didn't understand how powerful it was, but looking back, I see how powerful this is. And people ask me all the time, well, how did you, in the middle of all that mess, how did you get up? How did you go to work? Right. You know, and the answer is I felt like I was doing something important. Okay. And You had a why. I did. I had a big one. You, you but, had a what? But I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. And so that was that kind of that inner, that inner thing was, you know, I don't know what it is, but I'm, it's, uh, you know, I'm sure it's really big. Mm -hmm. But um, I felt like I was doing something important. I felt like if I would have gone, you know, no disrespect to the bank, because I think about that all the time. I felt like if I was go to work, well, first of all, I don't think that happened. I didn't, really have, <laughs> I didn't have discernible skills. I have a... I have a degree in history and museum studies, so we're not talking about lighting the world on fire. Right, right. right. But uh, by the way, great degree for an entrepreneur. Really good. Interesting. Any, anything liberal arts is yeah. a fantastic degree for entrepreneurs. And I'm a fan of history. So. There you go. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, but I felt like I was doing something important. I felt like we were working towards something that would be meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have. I didn't think it would be a billion dollar company. That was not even. People say. Well, can you, can you believe where you are today? And the answer is, the funny thing is, I don't know, hopefully this comes across okay. It's like that friend that you hadn't seen for months and they put on a lot of weight. Right. You're like, whoa! <laughs> but all the people around them are like, no, that's just, oh, what's right, his name? Right, you know? right, right, right. Because right. they see him every single they see day. every day. That's yeah, right. that's the that's way Abbott right. is. So yeah. It's like the friend that you haven't seen that, that put on a lot hilarious. of weight. That's funny. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, but at... At, at year two, you would think there are three failures, but the way that I, I, the way that it was perceived at the moment was wasn't failures. They were, well, that just didn't work out. Right, right. And right. and and that didn't bother me at all. It was mm -hmm. kind of like trying something. It's not like we put our heart and soul into it. Right. I mean, we put enough into it to see if it would work. But well, we always had the notion that we ought, we got so the goals something that people were willing to buy, and the market said no. So. Goal number one, we got to stick to goal number one, willing to buy, buy at a premium and then stick with us. We wanted a product that people would just use and use and use and use. Right. So here's what happened. Off the back of the third quote unquote failure, mm -hmm. one of our customers who I think they just did business with us because they felt sorry for us, <laughs> he said, he's Atlanta, Georgia, he said, you've created a problem for me, a requisition online, and then you send me a paper invoice. And he said, just kind of really, off the cuff, is there any way you can digitize the invoice? And they said, well, you know, let's, let's run it through the model here. Is it something people are willing to buy? And he uh -huh. said, yes. And they said, well, would you pay 75 grand for it? And he mm -hmm. said, absolutely. Now, keep in mind, we had only made 60 grand in the last two years. Oh, wow. So our reaction to 75 grand was, are you kidding? Right. Is right. this for real? Right. And then 97.7% is our retention rate from that day Whoa. on that product. Wow. Yep. Now, now, for for those who may not know, and I'm sure by the time you know you're watching this and you've seen some of the social media stuff we put out, you probably looked into it. You you guys are. I mean, at the end of the day, you're in payroll. We're mm -hmm. in we're in payments. Payments. Yeah, we're in payments, which means that whenever someone wants to make a payment, it's B two B payments. Right. Whenever someone wants to make a payment, 
to their landscape or they can send it through right. our uh, software. But, but the, the, the interesting thing about the, the world you're in, and this is why I truly believe it's a business unicorn, is because it's almost like going back to the dis disaster disruptor t piece you talked about. You're in a space that's not sexy. It is not sexy. There's nothing sexy about <laughs> this not business sexy. world, right? Yeah, yeah. About payment. No, There's nothing no, out there. Well, we technically automate the accounting process, which is not sexy. Right. Yeah. It, but at the same time, you're also the Tesla of the industry. No, right? it's, it's true. Like, everybody knows that to make an automobile, you get need a factory, you need some. But somehow Tesla became this yeah. thing that yeah. it, that kind of took the industry to another level. Yeah. And that's yeah. when I looked at what you guys do, I'm like, well, what is it? I can't put my finger on it on why Avid Exchange would make these sort of leaps that they've been able to make in such a short time. And the only thing I could come back to was there has to be something about the culture <laughs> and the and the and the vision in which you guys go about the business here. Talk a little bit about what, from the first time you hired the first employee, which was I'm sure yourself and a couple of the buddies, but no, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I remember the first, the first hire we made was a woman named Heather Caudill and she's runs our entire, she's SVP of services today. Okay. The great thing, I, I was just talking about this yesterday with somebody. Mm -hmm. The great thing about Heather is I don't know how many hundreds of people report back up to her, mm -hmm. but she, she has the ability to be in a meeting and someone say, you know, I got this issue and she will have lived that issue. Wow. Yeah, it's really remarkable. Wow. And, and, it, and, it, and it, people have a lot of respect for her because I remember when we hired her, I used to give her the, the worst jobs ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, she doesn't do those jobs now, but I got to right. tell you. So, it, so let me, so let me, um, so let me let me answer your question in a story if you don't mind. Sure, sure. And so when when we created that Avid Invoice product, um, that thing grew a million dollars every single year, steady. Wow. And then here's what happened: is that at year nine we realized that we had seven million dollars committed for that year. And I remember Mike, our, our CEO, talking about if we don't sell anything, which all the salespeople, I think we had like four salespeople, like, <laughs> I wish you would shut up about this. If we, and he's like, if we don't sell anything, we make $7 million. Now, here's the thing about that that I think is so remarkable is that most companies would have said, that's good. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I like to tell people, and see how this hits you, um, is that everything going okay is one of the biggest disruptors to big dreams. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah, when yeah. things are going okay, you're you have a tendency to leave well enough alone, not rock the boat. You and, get comfortable. Well, it that's the worst of yeah, it. Yeah, you get comfortable. But in this case you're like, you know what, I don't want to mess what up what I got going on here. Let's maintain it. So let's and then and then what happens is that they say, But you know what? I think there's more out there. Uh, but the thing is, when you want to go after the there's more out there, mm -hmm. um, you can't keep doing what you're doing expecting to get what you're getting. That's right. So if you want to go after what's out there, what you have to do is you have to change everything you think about. That's right. What you think about, what you think about when you go to sleep, when you wake up, how you go to work, when you go to work, who you talk to, right. who do you associate yourself with, what numbers, what KPIs, how you manage all, everything. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you, have to, you have to scrap everything and then move over here. So here's what we did is what we did was we um, we argued for about two years on whether we should just leave well enough alone or go after what we thought was the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. And we came to the conclusion that we're going to go after the big thing. Okay. The people who didn't had to leave. Mm -hmm. And they left. And these are people that I've known for a long time. Wow. And that actually was very, that was very emotional. Well, how, how does that journey hit a leader? Because in, in a, a, a regular person who might just be working as an individual contributor watching this interview might go, but yeah, most leaders kind of lead a callous life. Like they, they kind of cut and run and just keep it moving. How, how did that hit you to have to do that with people that have helped you kind of groom this thing to $7 million a year? It was, it was devastating. Now, here's the funny thing about it. The funny thing about it was all the talks up to and as they decided to leave, seemed very intellectual okay and but there was this incredible amount of passion around it and then when they when they left it was devastating because mm. like it doesn't have to be this way mm. you know, there, does it have to be winners and losers and the answer is yes interesting yeah
But here's what happened. This is what happened, is that we raised, we, we borrowed some money, we bought another company, we saw that they had a payment process, we didn't like the payment process, and we wrote a very simple program to analyze payments to determine if it could be paid electronically or by way of a check. Okay. And then someone said, on an offhanded comment, they said, instead of sending those payments through the bank, uh, you can send them through MasterCard. And the funny thing is that when you send a payment through MasterCard, MasterCard pays you a rebate, which is a bonus. Hmm. And we, we intellectually, we saw that happening. By the way, I'm going to have a moment of truth here because when we said, so here's what we said. Here's what the company said. The company said, we're going to take everything out of that product that had given us $7 million, all the development, all of the services. We're going to strip it down to its bare minimum. And we're going to put everything we have on this new, unproven product without any customers. Now, that is definitely the definition of risky um, and probably some heartburn. That <laughs> well, I said it wasn't going to work. I said wow. it was a terrible idea. Really? Well, because here's my thing. I knew all of those customers. And that was, that was kind of my wheelhouse with those customers. And, I, and my thing was, are you telling me that we are going to take our bread and butter... And we're going to bring it over here to right. the opposite of bread and butter. <laughs> Burnt toast. <laughs> Pastor turf. <laughs> what, you know, right. what, so you mean to tell me that we're going to leave all these people hanging mm -hmm. and we're going to put it all on this thing? Wow. And, um, and he said, yeah. Wow. And guess what? It won. Mm. It won in a big way. It won in a huge way. This thing... I probably shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> Every time we put a dollar into it, three were produced on the back end. So what if you could find a community of corporate professionals who also have side businesses and we're all just trying to learn from each other and learn how to grow? Well, that's why I'm here. You should join the Grow Your Side Business Challenge. That's right. I want you right now. Go to it right now. GrowYourSideBusiness.com. And guess what? You can opt into my five-day challenge. One hour per day, you and I are going to get together with a ton of other community people who, guess what? We're all trying to grow our side businesses, and we want to know how to do it the right way the first time. Well, guess what? I'm going to teach you some things that you didn't even know that you should be doing to leverage your corporate day job while also at the same time learning how to build that side business. And you're going to find out that actually if you do your side business the right way, it will impact the way you show up at work. And I'm going to show you some things that you didn't even know was possible. So for five days, for one hour a day, you and I get together. Now, I got two ways you can experience that. You could jump in to the general admission. Well, guess what? You just get access to the live training right then and there each and every day for one hour a day. Or you could jump into the VIP experience. My VIP people get a chance to actually talk with me, actually ask questions every single day if you would like to before the actual training. So guess what? You want to jump into the VIP experience because that is where you'll be able to get your questions answered and including the actual training live. So go to growyoursidebusiness.com, jump into the challenge, and I look forward to seeing you there. Okay. It's incredible. Okay. It's absolutely incredible. Now, 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 I, I want to pick your brain on that because you, you, and in your heart, were very sure this isn't going to work. I thought it was a terrible <laughs> idea. But then and I you, want to go back to this idea of risks too. Yeah. So so you 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 go to bed. You're 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 nervous. You're probably biting your nails. You're like, we're about to lose again, right? You're see, you probably saw that fourth loss yeah. coming. Yeah. But then it hits. How how did that impact you when you when you when the light bulb kind of went off to go? Oh my gosh, this actually might be a thing. Well, so here's the thing. Just to to tell the real story. I said, this is a terrible idea. We can't do this. There's got to be some kind of happy medium. Right. And, and it's really Mike, the CEO. He said, nope, this is the way it's going to be. And then when he said that, I said, I'm on board. Okay. So that, that's a really important distinction. Interesting. Because there was no heartburn. Right. There was, and, I, and my thing is, and maybe hopefully this will, this will kind of go back to the purpose of the podcast, is my thing is that people have to hear the word. You have to... You have to hear people's voices. Mm -hmm. But not only do you have to hear people's voices, but you have to hear the passion that's behind it. Right. But when the decision's made, that's it. That's right. That's it. Right. And um, I trusted I trusted in Mike, and I still do. I mean, mm -hmm. it was 
But the thing is, so remember that idea of risk? Well, you're yeah. risking everything. The reality is, we weren't really risking anything in, res in, in this respect that, so I get this all the time. I can't be an entrepreneur because I'm not a good risk taker. I don't know any successful entrepreneurs that are risk takers. <laughs> They're calculative. Yeah. So what I like to say is that, and by the way, you know, because I want to tell you about our fundraising. Yeah. And, um, I, I haven't met a venture capitalist or, or a fund person who's a risk taker either. I don't know. I don't have very many risk takers in my circle. Right. And now I know a lot of unskilled entrepreneurs that take these crazy risks, and I'm like, don't do that. Right, right. Don't do it. Don't um, bet the farm. Don't. You know. I mean, you can, but here's the thing. You can leverage we bet, the farm. We bet, <laughs> no, we bet the farm on that paper, and it, it went, it won. Okay. Because Mike knew it was going to win. He knew it. He was certain that it was going to win. And that's all I needed to know to go okay. along. Is that once he said this was going to win, mm -hmm. now I, t I gave my piece. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thank him every time I see him. But here's the thing, is that entrepreneurs aren't, aren't risk takers. They're geniuses at managing uncertainty. Mm. And that's a big difference if you mm. think about it. And so if you think about... And then hopefully I'm giving this to someone who will, it'll, their ears will perk up with, around the skill of managing uncertainty. I'm not a risk taker. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I do know that if I decide to do something, and I, I think there's another company in me, and I think there's another opportunity. Really? To do it. Oh, yeah. We'll oh, yeah. talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I don't have any desire or time frame to leave Avid Exchange, but I believe that there's another company in me somewhere. And I know that when I go and start that other venture, I'm not going to just copy and paste Avid Exchange because right. it won't work like that. Right. But I also know that there are certain things that I can count on to make myself successful. Absolutely. One, I can make my phone calls. Yeah. Two, I can sell the real value and impact. Yes, you know, things that anyone can do. Right. And right. that uh, you'll see entrepreneurs struggle. The entrepreneurs that struggle versus the ones that seem to do better, always have this real good focus on selling, on mm. real good selling. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's talk about um, your perspective on a couple of different items. When you talk about technology and you talk about a business like Avid Exchange, obviously you're bringing in multiple generations. You've been able to attract uh, people to this idea. I mean, there was an awesome special that was done on you guys a couple months ago, which is the reason why I even reached out because cool. I, I thought, wow, this is this really did happen. Yeah. Um, what do you think millennials bring to a company that might be missed by even Xers sometimes that is important, an important asset to, yeah. to the future and, and what's going on today in the world? Well, one, now by the way, this is interesting that we've connected because you probably don't know my secret undercurrent. My secret undercurrent is I believe that millennials, you know, quote unquote, make phenomenally good, innovative salespeople and entrepreneurs. Interesting. And the reason why is because in order to be an in order to sell something that's innovative, now first of all, you have to know a couple of things about innovation, is that when you're truly innovative, one, no one knows anything about you. Right. So two, they're scared to death. Right. And <laughs> Absolutely. three, no one's going to buy anything they're scared to death of. Right. <laughs> and you can, and you don't even have to think about technology. I mean, you can go all the way back to the automobile, right. back to, you know, the telephone or anything. You know, right. people just, when, 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 when something is brand new, people just fear it. That's right. And so it takes a really interesting person to be able to convey the impact and the positive nature of it. And what it does, one of the biggest things that it takes to be um, an innovative um, entrepreneur or sell anything that's innovative is the, um, the, the, dismiss, the natural dismissing of traditional models. Mm. So, mm. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> so if you take everything that millennials get dinged on, well, you know, they don't pay they don't pay their dues. <laughs> right. You know, they don't listen. They're always opinionated. Right, right. All of those things make the perfect 
innovative entrepreneur, innovative salesperson. Interesting. Because you have to leave everything traditional at the door. So, so then how, how then does someone in your position with a company like this, how do you foster the innovative spirit in an employee. Yeah. Because the two don't, the, the math doesn't add up. No, it doesn't. Right? It doesn't. And it's really hard to do because, so I'm not a big fan of managing. I don't like to manage. I think that, so you talked to a couple of our avid extras mm-hmm. and a couple of them, remember one of them said that they have a lot of freedom. Yeah. They do have a lot of freedom. We give, and so one of the ways that you can foster innovation and um, deal with uh, with change. You know, we have 1,200 employees on January 1st, 2018. From January 1st of 2017 to January 1st of 2018, 75% of our employees had a brand new job. Wow. Just within one year. Wow. A brand new job. Interesting. They, they were doing something, they're doing something different. And so one of the downsides to fast growth and change is poor communication. Well, look, it looks like poor communication because right. you just can't tell everybody what they need to know because <laughs> once you get yourself organized to tell everyone, it's changed right. again. <laughs> the ink hasn't dried. So yet. people have to kind of ride along with this. And so one of the things that we do is we give them space. And uh, not everybody, because there's certain certain jobs that you know we have to kind of manage closely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of space here at Abbott Exchange, and when you give people, especially people in that millennial category, space, um, you're going to find out what they're really about. Mm-hmm. And I'm a big fan of instincts. I know that kind of goes off the edge, but I'll give you a background story because I I play music, and I've played a lot of music for a long time. And when I meet a musician and we're jamming together or we're playing together, before we get in front of someone, I want to know what their natural inclination to that piece of music is going to be. And the reason why I want to know that is because when you're put under pressure, that's what's going to come out. Right, right. And and it's the same thing in selling. It's the same thing in decision making is that when you're under pressure, your instincts take over. That's right. And so... um, when you give people space and you let them use their natural instincts, then you're going to find out if there's someone that is, is, is going to make an impact or not. Absolutely. So there's two schools of thought about the workplace environment. There's the traditional model, yeah, which is more of a waterfall approach. Yeah. And lately over the last short of a decade has been this new idea of agile. Yeah, this new idea of thinking that is fundamentally different than pay me for doing X amount of work for this thing over and over and over and over and over again. How have you been able to balance over the last several years of building this company the way in which work gets done at the same time, you know, there's there's processes that have to be done in a certain way. But then there's this, as you mentioned, you're giving people space. That also means there's a gray space for some some innovation, some gray space to kind of, I saw it on the sign out there, and we'll put it up on the screen, fail fast, fail hard, yeah, yeah, right? How, yeah. how do you manage that so that people don't go, what the heck are we doing here, right? Yeah. But they can, yeah. they see that there's that, that space that makes people want to keep coming back. How do you manage that? Because those two styles at some point in a company are probably existing at the same time. Oh, yeah. yeah. And by the way, we, um, you know, as much as I'd like this to be a, a, an Avid Exchange pep rally, we struggle with the same thing. <laughs> okay. And we yeah. have, and I'll, I mean, I can call it out if you want me to. One, yeah. one of the things that we struggled with early was we kept promoting people who did the task really well. And what I realized was that two negative things happen one is so let's say you have a group of 10 people doing the same task and the one that's like the top performer and usually a top performer in a group isn't like just a little over you know you they're usually top performing sure. 10 20 times sure and so what we did we take that person and we make them a manager and the two negative impacts it had is first of all it immediately impacted the um the production of the group in a negative way production went way down wow because we plucked them out Mm -hmm. and then the second thing is we accidentally put that person on a fast track to burnout because their their inclination was 
do it like this. Okay, just let me do it. Right, right. <laughs> right. They were a performer for a reason. Yeah. And so we uh, that took us a long time. And then when we found that issue, we overcorrected it. And mm-hmm. what we did is we started really coveting people who had um, – job titles from the outside and put them in here oh okay gotcha yeah, gotcha okay yeah. and so that huh. created because we would say well they're an svp with this type of company we're going to put them in here as an svp and then they just can't keep up with our 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 speed yeah and it was and it really felt because here's the thing we talked about this before we turned the camera on and that is you know people don't work for companies right they work for other people they work for other people yeah and, and they also leave a company for the same reasons that's exactly right <laughs> that's exactly right no one quits a company they right. quit their managers yeah and um so space is a big thing if you give people enough space depending upon the job um they'll have the ability to figure it out kind of on them their selves and then um, the one thing that we're really ramping up is this whole mentoring thing, mm-hmm. this whole coaching thing. Mm-hmm. And now I run a secret mentoring group. Okay. You know, don't tell anyone. Right. But <laughs> here's the key to my secret mentoring group that I, I really um, – it, it's had great results, not because of me, but I think because of this one small little nuance. And that is we don't meet regularly. We meet when the person being mentor wants to meet. Oh, there you go. And so, so that's what I'm talking about, yeah. space. Mm-hmm. Because corporate America, there I can I can tell you how to kill culture. Put someone in charge of it. Interesting. Yep. That's gonna be probably on every single Instagram post that we put out there. Just <laughs> letting you know right now. That's a really good one. Wow. Because interesting. Because once you put someone in charge of it, it no longer ceases to be owned by everyone else. Wow. Yep. Wow, interesting. And we'll be back after these messages. Yeah, should we stop? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a wow, that's a that's a fascinating um thought because there's a new movement out here. Uh chief heart op- officer, the yeah. you know, head of, you know, all, Maybe that's my next thing. You know, that <laughs> wow, that's a, that's h- However, um would you say there's some credence to having people or someone at least being mindful that hey if our if our morale is going down yeah well by the way we need to find out why so uh, so here's the thing is that me at avid exchange one of my primary jobs is that um is that i call myself the unofficial cultural cheerleader okay and and but the thing is this i didn't call i didn't make that up they put it on me okay the group put it on me okay and so, and no one voted for me, mm-hmm. and no one signed me up for it. And by the way, there will probably be a day when I'm not it, and someone else is. Right. right. And so, um, but for the moment, you know, I'm that person. I'm that person. So, so let me ask you this question, because I'm I, I'm sure many people would want to know. You're at a billion dollars valuation now. One point four. One point four. <laughs> Make sure that four, point four, because that's an important point four. Yeah, yeah, it is. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Well, let me. I'm going to honestly tell you that nothing, because I have a, I have a very. So we. It would be great to get into this one day, but I have a, a pretty strict way. And I, I, the other thing is, I work a solid eight. Okay. I work a solid eight, but uh, the 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 whole principle of a solid eight is I'm not checking my Facebook, you know, I'm not looking at YouTube right, videos. Right. I'm like from, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's right. You know, eight to five lunch, whatever right. you want to do. It doesn't right. work out like that very evenly because I travel a lot like you. But when I travel, so I'll be in Vegas next week. Mm-hmm. But I'm stopping my week uh, halfway through Thursday, and then Thursday and Friday. Um, I'm not going to work because I have put my 40 hours right. in. And one of the things that I do is every week, so I set my goals. I wish I had my book with me. I'd show it to you. I set my goals. I have been doing that for 23 years now. And then every week I hold myself accountable and I write a list of the things I did well, just in story form. Here's what I did well last week. Interesting. And here's what I need to improve on this week. Wow. And then I, and then I do my bullets. Mm-hmm. So I do all the things that I have to do this week to be successful based on my goals. So they have to have an anchor or a purpose. And then the great thing about when you do that is that when you've ticked off all the things that you can do, you've given yourself the right to say, 
I'm done. Interesting. So Interesting. no matter what is swirling around me and mm-hmm. all of the mess, if I focus on the things that I needed to do today and I get them done, um, I don't think of anything else. Wow. So one of the things that um, companies struggle with, and I would say boomers and, and millennials definitely struggle together with, is this idea of communication. Yeah. Uh, a millennial may struggle in the sense that they're trying to communicate a way to go yeah. that they, they're they really passionate about, right? And a boomer may struggle with trying to say, hey, you know what? You might be right, but I don't know the best way to support that. Yeah. But other than what we've done that's been successful. That's right. What are some common misconceptions that you think um, happen when it comes to communicating? Hey, so let me ask you a question. If you knew there was a way to be able to take your side business, grow it amongst a community of people, and it only took you five days, one hour a day to do it, would you jump into the challenge? I think you would. My name is Chris Williams, and I am here to help you. So I want you right now to go to growyoursidebusiness.com and join me for a five-day challenge. As a corporate professional, you know you want to increase your income and your value in the marketplace. Well, that's why you started your side business to begin with. But you're not really sure what to do, what levers to pull, what things would actually help grow the needle. Well, I'm going to show you in five days, one hour a day, how to make that happen. One of the great things is I've got two ways you can interact inside of this challenge. I do have a general session. That's right. You get to hop on, hop into the Facebook group and see the entire training live. Or if you really want to step up your game and if you really want to grow, then guess what? You could join into my VIP experience. The cool part about that is you get to ask questions specifically on what you're doing, how it's working all the way from me and my wife and everybody. And guess what? Everybody gets the benefit of your question because you'll be surprised. Sometimes we're asking questions that other people also want to know the answer to. So in the VIP experience, you get to do that. So I've got VIP, journal admission, either one, you're going to learn a lot from me. Five days, one hour a day, jump in. Go to growyoursidebusiness.com right now. I'll see you in the challenge. That's a great question. Um, I want to do a little bit of an aside too. Sure. Let me ask you a question. I want to tell sure. you something about how important this is. Sure. Is that um, a lot of people? So, a lo- I've noticed between the generations, the thing is, well, you what you need to do is you need to have a well warded letter and a you know this, and then you need to do your hand motion like this right. and like <laughs> this. And yeah, like the, I, there was, I read a book about significant hand motions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't yeah. a whole book, but it was a chapter. And I was like, really? Really? But, um, well, 93% of communication is nonverbal. That's right. Absolutely. So uh, I think there's a lot to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and pe- some people, a lot of times, the generational people get hung up on. Uh, I want to help you become better than you are. So they have a great intent and they have terrible execution. Interesting. And the intent is I want to help you get better. And the execution is so you should sit like this and you should walk right. like this and you Wear should your talk power like tie. Yeah, and it's not <laughs> like that at all. Right. So one of the things I do with my family, so I have four kids and I have a wife that if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> <laughs> I got another one too. I, like that. I got another one. Oh, that's you never really know. Good. This is this is her as a pinup. So oh, yeah. Wow. So um, we're gonna get a close up of that. Yeah, we we'll get a close up. We'll do the hilarious. tour of the tattoos. But um, the other thing is, you ever notice that when couples get older, they start looking similar? Mm-hmm. One day I'm gonna be hot. <laughs> <laughs> one day. Yeah, one day. There. I hope so. <laughs> but uh, so one of the things that I realized about my family when I was young, when I was really young, it was just Adela and I, my wife and I. One of the things I learned is that I, I always felt like if I had business success, if I made money at business, and I had business success, my family would be happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Here's what I found out, though, that it needs to be flipped. And it was, it was only until I flipped that idea okay. that things started working out for and me. And what was the flip? The How flip was you? real simple. So it's my, my thought was, as a young man, how goes my business, so goes my life. Okay. The reality is, how goes my life, my family, so goes my business. Interesting. So if everything is going great with my family, then business 
kind of takes care of itself. Mm. And so, um, and I, I pursued this thing that, and I thought it was so smart because I pursued this thing. First of all, I told my family, I said, so I managed my family by principles, okay. not by edict. And so one of our principles on grades, this is going to mess a lot of people up, <laughs> is it's, it's effort, not outcome. So if you put in the effort and you get a C, but you put in the effort, I'm cool. Okay. I'll tell you something about my son is he had to repeat the seventh grade. He'll freak out um, about this. But he was devastated. I bet. And I was devastated because one, one of the most difficult things as a leader to do is – let the people you're leading fail. Yeah. But yeah. what's worse about it is that you usually see that failure like miles away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you got to let them go through that. Mm -hmm. And he was so obstinate and headstrong. And, you know, what would it have served me to go to the school and say, listen here, you sons of a gun, right. you better pass him along. <laughs> you're screwing me. Right, you know what? Right. So It wasn't about your pride at that moment, though. But I – it, no, it wasn't. It felt, I wish it would have. No. But – I said, I said, I said, Kyle, look, to get what you got, you, you put in the effort, you did the time, and you got the result. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want a different result, you have to put in different effort and different time. Interesting. And then he graduated a year early, and then he's on A, B, on a roll. So, you know, it was that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's going to college, starts college in the fall. And so, wow. yep. Yeah. But you see, that's the toughest thing. And I managed my... I manage my family by principles, and so there's certain principles that we have that they... But the thing about principles is I give them the overall idea, and they uh -huh. figure out the details. Right, And right. going back to your question, which you probably forgot what your question was. No, it was, it was around <laughs> it was on communication. communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, to me, I use the same approach in my business life, is that I don't want to tell you how to do it, but let me give you a couple of things to think about uh -huh. so where you can figure it out on your own. Interesting. And... Um, the uh, CEO of Nike uh, once talked about that, and he said, all I do is ask my team a lot of questions, but I don't provide them a lot of answers. No, and I like to do it one step further and do drama on it and say, this is yours to figure out, uh, and I hope there's pressure on you because the thing is, you're going to have to figure it out. Now, by the way, I'm going to help you. Yeah. I'm going to do whatever I can to do to help you, but I'm not going to do it. Right. It's yours to do... Um, and let me know what kind of help you need. Yeah, now, by the way, yeah. I do that all the time because I want them to provide the energy to come to me. That's right. Because if I prop you up, I'm just propping you up. Right. So then here's the side I want to say. So I don't know if you know this, but I spent 13 years in prison. Did you know that? Now, as I a did not know that. As a volunteer. Okay. As a volunteer. <laughs> yeah. I would, I'm going to stop it right there. <laughs> and then like everybody's going to go, we Did never you, knew he went to prison. Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. I've been in and out of prison for years. <laughs> but um, so I was involved with a, um, it's a prison ministry. And one okay. of the, the only things that we did was teach those young men and they were between the age of 15 and 18 how to forgive that was it wow but here's what i here's the one thing that really bothered me about the young men that were in prison is that they had no ability to communicate mm -hmm. and you know they would use all the colloquialisms and you know i remember one guy say you, you know what i'm saying i said i know exactly what you're saying and it kind of <laughs> And, and I'm cool with that. And I'm cool with that, especially when you talk to your friends. Right. But out in the business world, it has a tendency to um, have a negative impact. Sure. And if sure. you can't communicate basic stuff, you have, the no, you have no ability to motivate people. Right. And when you can't motivate people, you have no ability to attract people to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you can't attract people to what you're doing... You have no chance of being an entrepreneur. You have wow. no chance of selling. Wow. You know, Interesting. It's all Interesting. about it being attractive. Right. And then the other thing with, um, with millennials, you know, the whole notion of, you know, like every other word has a tendency to turn people off. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying don't change it. If that's the way you right. talk and you want to be like that, do it. <laughs> but understand there might be certain things that you might have to change or just disregard. I've had to do it. Um, so you asked me about my younger self. I feel like I'm rambling way too much. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, one of my younger good. selves, one of my younger selves was anytime I had a chance to crack a joke, bust on you, bust on them, I'd do it. Right. And I felt like if I got a laugh out of people, it somehow validated my actions. Interesting. But what I found out is that was cutting 
humor on the other person. Okay. And I and I had to stop it because people didn't see me as serious. Mm-hmm. People didn't take me seriously enough. So when you talk about the the evolution of not just this business, I'm hearing from you that there's been an evolution of Chris. Oh. That that the business has taught you more than oh. you probably have provided to it. So 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 tell so, so that's why when people give me credit for building this thing, which I had a hand in it, I just am not comfortable with. Okay. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So when you when you think about institutional knowledge of what Avid is today, mm. when you think about the young lady who's walking in for her first interview with Avid and you're like, that's a bright star. Yeah. What are you guys doing to try to groom that next set of of leadership? What's kind of the thing that you guys focus on when you notice there's a star there or there's somebody that you go, you know what? It's a raw diamond, but if yeah. we if we work on it, I think we've got something. What do you what do you guys kind of focus on now? So I'll tell you so the first thing that we do, the first thing that I do that I love to do is that every new employee we do uh, I get an hour with them, I take them through the history and then I tell them all the stupid things that we did. The kind of funny, stupid things. Right. I tell them about how we came up with Avid Pay then and who we are and then I take them through how we create ideas which is something that we hadn't talked about Mm -hmm. and then at the very end of that I go person by person if I have 30 people I go person by person and I ask them what did you what did you take away from this time and they always say rarely do they say anything other than this I like it when you guys did and then they said it now for me every kind of small session that I do I get feedback from the group because that's their way of of solidifying and learning but I let them go through all that, and then I say, here's the thing. You want to know how to do really well at Avid Exchange? You want to know the secret between people who have done really well and people who have struggled? Is that every time you said, I like it when you guys did this, you flip it, and you say, I like it when we did this. Mm-hmm. And I, I always say, every single story I have told is now yours to retell just as if you, you were there. Interesting. Wow. You have it, you own it, and it's yours. Interesting. And um, I think to me that is the best way because, first of all, that hopefully that gets us out of the us versus them, yeah, new yeah, versus yeah. old. Yeah, absolutely. But the other thing is when they start retelling the story about going to New York City and saying, I guess all the good names are taken, that's theirs. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in reality, to get really stupid and deep about it is, in essence... They were really there. If you mm-hmm. think about it, they right. were they were there. They're right. a part of that, and um, so that's that's the biggest thing that I did. Yeah. So let, let's let's shift gears here for a second, and I want to talk about Mike. I want to talk about what it was like to go from uh, someone you're trying to build with mm. to now someone you're you're looking at that next big thing. Mm-hmm. with right what what's been the relationship like for you two and how did you guys strike such a balance to where eventually you know what he was good at yeah he knew what you were good at and yeah. you guys you don't get in each other's way yeah. how does that work when you're well, working at this level i'll tell you something and i'm going to be very clear about this and it's not, it's not going to make for good sound bites is that i do basically what he says and um and i know that's not cool and no. i know that's not I know that's not, um, but I trust him. Yeah. I trust him more than anything. And, you know, as a business person, I trust him. Sure. And I just think he's a genius, and I have a lot of respect for him. And the respect has only grown. Um, so he leads, I follow. Uh-huh. That's a really hard thing to do. Interesting. Because most people want to outlead other people. Well, when most people think of an entrepreneur, they think of a disruptor, yeah, somebody yeah. who doesn't follow the yeah, rules, yeah. somebody, you know, there's this stigma, yeah. right? There's well, that's stigma. me. <laughs> <laughs> but there's certain things that I can't do. Okay. And one of the one of the things I can't do is have that big vision that Mike has. I can't do that. I can't think because Mike is... So, and, you know, we had another company before this. We had CareerShop.com, and that uh-huh. started in his bonus room in uh, 1997. Wow. So 21 years. And that one went pretty well, too. But, um, you know, 
it was fortunate because as he went on and kept doing big vision, I, ke- I went on and kept working in the, in, the, in the company, and I don't regret that at all. I had some heartburn on that years ago thinking, well, I should probably, you know, have a higher rank. I, I don't have a rank. I gave my title back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> or I should maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should have a bigger department or a bigger uh-huh. group or maybe a better office. And, and, the, and the reality is I know who I am. I know who I am. Uh, and I know, I know, I know what my skill is. Mm-hmm. And I know that I am, I am the, I am the customer guy. Mm-hmm. I'm the customer guy and I'm the deal guy too. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I'm not kidding myself because I'm not going to create um, three, ten, ten, three year strategy. I mean, I could, but right. it wouldn't be good as mine. <laughs> so, so with the last few minutes that we have, I, I've got a couple of other questions. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about this concept that is in corporate America now that is alive and well, that uh, is a bit of a struggle right now, which is the frozen middle, which is middle management. Yeah. I have I have done poor middle management. <laughs> I have done some research and I've looked at a, a couple of things. But here's here's my theory, and and I, I would love to get your reaction. I I feel like what happened in the '70s and '80s was people found a spot within the company to rest in. That if I run really hard and get there, a couple of assumptions were made. I won't have to deal with people, which was not true. But then also, um, I get to tell people what to do so I ultimately can be in control. And I feel like they lost a bit of the people skill in the pursuit Mm -hmm. of a particular spot. I don't Mm -hmm. want to be too high because that makes me too visible. And I don't want to be too low because then that means uh, I'm still kind of being controlled. In the frozen middle, I'm comfortable. I can kind of move about the way I need yeah, to. Yeah. In the last 10, 12 years, that space has gotten smaller and smaller and squeezed. I, I didn't know that. Squeezed. That's good. <laughs> it, it, I, I would say that um, it's, it's still there. It's not that it doesn't exist. I just think that um, the, the responsibilities that were needed for the middle 30 years ago are no longer needed because individual contributors and executives kind of have pulled those roles apart. What What is your thoughts on 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 middle management? And well, one is that this company changed remarkably when we had to get middle management, and the the nuance was they don't do anything, don't freak, because <laughs> they're not the contributor and they're not the executive. They're right there in the middle. Right. But for us, we're lucky because a lot of people go through and up through middle management Uh and that creates a dynamic to where it doesn't have that kind of push and pull there's no segregation by the way i want to get rid of job titles i can't stand jobs. really why would you want to get rid of job titles i want to get rid of job titles i want to get rid of offices because i think they're the two biggest barriers to people doing this whole mix-up mash-up thing and i want and, and i well one and this is just my opinion I believe that people that go after job titles are climbing the ladder. I'm not a big fan of climbing the ladder. I don't want to be known for what I own. I want to be known for what I do. And so when you interact with me, I want you to, I want you to know what I do, what, Mm -hmm. you know, my potential outcome is. Right. I don't want to own anything. Mm. And so the people now, and we have them here, but the people who clamor for the job title, they go for the space, they create the fiefdom. It's always fleeting. But but the ti- but but on the other side of that, the title is a sense of achievement. It's a it's a a validation sometimes. It's uh you know, the title is not always the worst thing on the planet. Sometimes it's just I, I finally achieved something that I set out to do and now I'm the vice president of right. sales. Vice president right? of sales. <laughs> hey, but let me tell you something. What's better be a vice president of sales? in a $50,000 company or be personally responsible for $10 million. So interesting. Right. I mean, you're the CEO. Okay. How many employees do you have? Well, it's just me. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not busting on it. Right. And if you're the CEO and you're a solopreneur, do it, do it. But I'm saying that when you're a VP, 
and so you're a VP of a small organization, great. But if you personally know how to produce ten million dollars, right. and you know kind of the levers to pull to create ten and bring it ten to fifteen, right. and fifteen to twenty, that's really valuable. It is. It's really valuable because not not because that you're the puppet master. Right. It's because of what it makes you. It's because it makes you valuable to the company. It makes you valuable to the company. But what did I have to do to learn? how to get from 10 to 15 what did that make me how did that mold me and i always tell entrepreneurs maybe we can finish on this because this is entrepreneurs they what they do is they concentrate on the thing the app the site way too much Mm -hmm. and they don't concentrate on the important thing which is the journey because the journey is the thing that makes you right and and when you go from point a to point b and then you look back whether it's a week month year 10 years me 30 years you always think, man, that was cool. Yeah. And then you, you point out the things that you struggled with right. and you overcame. And you never said, well, I just set myself up perfect for that and it was good. <laughs> right. It was always the thing that you overcome. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So last question I'll ask you is this. And then can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Avid Exchange is what it is today. Right. What's the future? So we have a goal to uh, quadruple our value to triple our revenue, to and then to sustain 40% growth year over year, and then we'll IPO. And it'll be the first time in IPO history those three things have been done. Wow. Our valuation at our revenue rate with 40% year over year growth. And so we will make history. We'll, we'll make IPO history. Well, you're making it already in yes. Charlotte for one, but I, I will say that that is, that is something that is... Uh, an interesting journey that, from what I can tell, and, and being here, um, people are definitely with it. It's true. And, you know, here's the great thing, you know, kind of putting a ball in this culture thing. One of the things that you can do to to spike your culture and to in, invest in your culture and enthuse your culture is to set enormous goals. Yeah. So when you realize that you've come on to Avid Exchange and you're now pursuing history, it does something to you. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So you had a question for me. Yeah, my question is, I ask, this, I ask the people this all the time. So you heard the story and you kind of did your research. So what's kind of the one or two things you took away, really stuck with you? And I, the reason why I'm not, by the way, I'm not looking for pats on the back yeah. or ego stroke. I'm always fascinated on what resonates with people. I, I think the thing that has resonated with me has been the the ability to take again because I, I care about culture and I look at industries you took a non sexy process <laughs> like again like seriously like that fascinates <laughs> me you took a non sexy process you put your spin on it and you became the unicorn in a city that like there's there's no reason Avid Exchange should be here. You should be in San Diego. No, you should be yeah, in. Yeah. I would even give you Austin, Texas. Yeah, yeah. I will give yeah. you New York. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Give, you know, like there's no real reason why this. For everything that is right, is also the, there's ten things why this shouldn't have worked. Yeah, right. It shouldn't have worked in Charlotte. Yeah. It should not have worked the way it did. The the, the, the you took a process that okay everybody needs, but. Nobody thinks it's sexy. People yeah. hate sometimes, and there's you know the you great thing that. about automating a process. People hate; they never want it back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And, and so it's, it was. That's what fascinated me was to go how. And so when I saw the piece on you guys, I'm like, I'm going after that company. I got to get them on the show because I'm like, th- that is mind blowing to me. That's cool. That that would happen, and and in a city that does not do a good job of uh, promoting space for entrepreneurs yeah, to really yeah. build yeah. the way they need to build, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It is a traditional city, and I yeah. get that, and, it, and that's what makes it the city, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's good. So just to wrap this up, let me say, um, Chris, you and Mike are a, a, a pleasure because um, I think for young people like myself, for for the leaders in this company, whether they're individual contributors today, whether they're managers right now, or wherever they are, um, you guys continue to kind of be that light, that North Star for cool. people. Um, it is, it is, 
immediately obvious. Um, as I came in, I'll yeah. give you this cool story. Oh, good. When I came in and I got to the front desk, yeah. uh, the gentleman there told me, I said, I'm looking for Chris Elmore. I'm yeah. here to interview him today. You know what he said? <laughs> oh, gosh. You'll feel him. I don't know where he is right now, but you will feel him when he shows up. <laughs> you know and why? I thought <laughs> they do that to me all the time is because uh, they can't find me. That's and what I he just said. show up. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah. He said he will just show up and you will feel him. <laughs> But that speaks to um, the version of human that you are. Oh, uh, one of the things that is very important to me is that I want to humanize CEOs and Good. leaders. Good. Because I realize that that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're dogmatic. They're carrying a yeah. big axe. And they're yeah. you know, charging and leaving blood on the trail. Yeah. And you guys are far from that. Well, yeah. Well, uh, I pre- appreciate you lumping me into that thing. And <laughs> I got to tell you... The, uh, I learned that the key to true happiness is the quality of the relationships that you have. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.